All right. All right, y'all. Prophet David Taylor here on Second Thursday Nights. <clears throat> on Second Thursday Nights, you know, I do my No More Genie series. No More Genie series. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So uh, let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Thanking you for this broadcast. Thanking you for your mighty word. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to dive into your word and have our eyes open and to see truth. So please be in the midst of this broadcast, oh God. Please have your way. Let the words be spoken that you would have spoken so that you might be glorified, that the saints might be edified, and that the demons might be terrified. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. To the glory of the Father, in the name of the Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. So, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a lot of information, so you need to watch this video more than once. Okay? Because I have a lot that I'm going to give you. Okay? So watch it more than once to be sure that you catch it all. Okay? Let's start with my tagline. What's my tagline? My tagline is that God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets. Let me say it again. God already told you the future. He already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets. Okay? So again, I want to extend a warm welcome to all my audiences, to my Facebook Live audience, my Periscope audience. And if you're watching this replay on YouTube, I want to extend a warm welcome to you too. And thank you for watching the video. When you come on live tonight, please like and share. If you're watching a replay, please like and share, okay? Why do I say that? Here's why. Because when God gives a prophetic word and when God gives a prophetic gift, it's always designed to change nations, okay? Go back and read the scripture. God never gives a prophetic word or prophetic gift just arbitrarily. It's always designed to change a nation. So when you come on tonight, please like and share, okay? Please invite others to watch this broadcast live. Please post it on your web pages. And if you're watching the replay, please share the link, okay? Because it's designed to get out and change the lives of nations, okay? If you want to support my ministry, uh, I have a paypal.me link on Facebook Live and on my Periscope profile, also on my Twitter feed. And then I'm going to be getting some new apps because I was told some of that is a little difficult. So I'm going to be getting some new apps with the new year, probably get Cash App or Zelle or something like that, which is much easier. Uh, hello, Anna, welcome. Well, which is much easier uh, to deal with, but uh, that'll be coming up. But definitely, I appreciate your support. The scripture says that if you receive a prophet, because he is a prophet, Matthew 10, 41, you shall receive a prophet's reward. So there's nothing that God would bless me with that he won't bless you with when you sow into a prophet's ministry. You can also donate, uh, donate through Amazon Smile. If you buy anything through the Amazon Smile link, then Amazon donates a portion of the proceeds to uh, Prophet David Taylor NFP, okay? All right, now how and where to find me? I always has, hashtag everything I do online with hashtag PDT. So if you ever want to look me up online, just look up hashtag PDT. That's the fastest way to find me on YouTube, on Facebook, on Periscope. Any place you want to find any of my videos, any of my teachings, just look up hashtag PDT. Uh, that stands for Prophet David Taylor, hashtag PDT. My regular broadcast is on Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I do that every week. And then on the second Thursday nights, once a month, I do what I'm doing now. I'll do a series called No More Genies, where we address and we take down the genie concept of God. Okay? Because the genie concept of God has caused a lot of damage and caused a lot of pain and has actually cost some people their lives. So that's why I feel so compelled to release this teaching into the world to let you know that God is not a genie and that faith is not magic. <laughs> so we have to study the scriptures to find out what the truth really is. Okay. All right. Now I told you last month, last month I did part one of what if I'm angry with God? And I went through six different, six or seven different ways that we get angry with God. Okay. So I told you what I'm going to do tonight is part two is I'm going to show you how to work through all of the anger that we talked about in part one. OK, so that's what we're going to study tonight. We're going to study how to work through all of the anger we talked about in part one. So this is what if I'm angry with God? Part two. Part one was identifying our different sources of anger with God. And part two tonight is going to be 
working through. How do I work through my anger with God? Because a lot of people out there are angry with God. Again, that's why I want you to share the broadcast, because there are a lot of people out there blaming God for stuff that's not God's fault. And there's a lot of people out there that are angry with God because they don't really get how life works. Okay? So we're going to dive into that tonight. So let's dive on in. All right. So the first thing we talked about last month, why you're angry with God. Principle number one, you're angry with God because he is God and you are not. You don't get to decide <laughs> how life works. Everything in creation works the way God wants it to work. Not the way you want it to work. Okay? Uh, and that's probably the number one reason that people are angry with God. Because human pride makes you think that you get to decide how all of this goes. And you didn't create not near lick of it. <laughs> that's the old folks saying. You didn't create one line of it. You didn't create one atom, one molecule of life that you create. Think about it. Trees, water, chemical reactions, fire, elements, human sexuality, food, music, you know, acoustics, the science of sound, physics, constellations, planets. Think about it. You didn't create any of that. You just came out of your mother's womb and lived a few years and became self-aware. And all of this was already in motion. You know why? Because he is God and you are not. And God set this in motion at the beginning of creation. It therefore does not work the way you think it should work, and it doesn't have to, okay? So, what's the solution? If you're mad at God uh, because you're mad at the way life works, and you, you, you think that it ought to go the way you're supposed to go, and you're balling your fist up to heaven, and you're cursing and you're angry and all that, what's the solution? How do you work through that, okay? The solution is humility. You must humble yourself. Okay? Let's look at some scriptures. James, as in the New Testament, James chapter 4, verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now when you see that phrase that God resists the proud, if you look that up, that's more of a military term. It means that God actively fights against you when you're proud. Oh, Lord have mercy. That means that you as a creature of clay and breath on planet earth are trying to ball your fist up at God and tell him how this is supposed to go. God will actively fight you when you have that kind of attitude. Did you know that? But then it goes on to say, but he, God giveth grace unto the humble. You have to humble yourself. Okay. If you are mad at the way life works, the solution is humility. Humility to understand, hey, Erica, Humility to understand that you are, in fact, not God, and that you did not create any of what you're dealing with, and you have to humble yourself. But the Bible says, if you don't, that God will actively resist you. But he says, God will open his hand and give you grace if you humble yourself. Now, also, I want to focus in on something that, let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. 2 Chronicles, that's the Old Testament. Corinthians is the New Testament. Chronicles is the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Good gravy from the Navy. Okay, let's dive into that verse. First word in that verse is if. <laughs> that means it's conditional. You've been crying out to God. You've been yelling to God. You've been getting mad at God because you want the land to be healed. The land does not get healed by magic. Okay? Because it doesn't work the way you think it should work. It says, if my people, it's talking about Christians, it's talking about believers. If my people, which are called by my name, Christian, Christian, okay? Christ, the name of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, that was the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the New Testament, it's Christians, Christians, called by my name, check this out, shall humble themselves. There it is. You have to humble yourself. You have to make the choice to humble yourself before Almighty God. <clears throat> that means if you don't want to humble yourself, you don't have to, but that also means the land will never get healed. That's why some people stay in trouble for decades, because they refuse to humble themselves. 
You have to humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now, let's look at all the conditions God put on that healing. If my people, you got to be born again, called by my name, Christians, shall humble themselves. You got to humble yourself and you got to pray and you have to seek his face and you have to turn from your wicked ways. That's six things God said need to happen. Okay. Why does he say and seek my face? Because God wants you to seek his face and not his hand. What do I mean by that? A whole lot of people just want to seek God's hand. They just want to ask God for self again, like he's a genie. That's tantamount to your kids walking in your house. They're coming home from school. They don't speak to you. They don't say hi to mama and daddy. They don't ask you how you are. They just put their hand out and say, give me some money. Give me the car keys. Give me. Okay? That's what God is saying. You don't walk up to God with your hand out saying, give me, give me, give me. That's seeking his hand. God wants you to seek his face, a relationship. Isn't that how you want somebody to treat you when they come in your house? Hi, how you doing? How was your day? How you feeling? What's going on with you? Isn't that what you want? Well, that's what God wants. He wants a face-to-face -face relationship, not you just come give me. That's why he said, seek my face, not my hand. God said, don't be running up in my presence, always trying to ask me for stuff. Ask for a relationship with me. That's what he wants. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, wait, and turn from their wicked ways. God said, you got to stop living wickedly. Remember, I told you the foundation of genie concept is people thinking you can live any kind of way you want to and God's going to bless you anyway. That's not what the Bible teaches. Turn from their wicked ways. Then, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal, the, heal their land. So if you are a believer and you're wondering why your land isn't healed, it's because you're missing one of those conditions. You're not actually born again, and you're not actually calling upon God in the name of Jesus. You have not humbled yourself. You're not praying. You have no prayer life. You're not seeking the face of God, and you're still living wickedly. That's why your land's not healed. You got to meet all those conditions. Then God will hear you. God will forgive you, and then he'll heal your land. You see what I mean? So all this is under, this is why you need humility, because it's not going to work the way you think it should work. It's going to work the way God told you it works. Okay? Then also, uh, let's look at another principle, Luke chapter 14, verse 11. Now, Luke is the third book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, okay? Luke chapter 14, verse 11, it says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Once again, I want you to notice the wording of the scripture. That's something that Jesus Christ himself said. He said, you've got to humble yourself. That means God is not going to humble you. <laughs> it's your choice. You have to humble yourself. Whosoever exalts himself shall be abased or brought low. That means that if you balling up your fist at God and you are using profanity and you cursing God's name and you're trying to tell God how all is supposed to go, you're going to be brought low every time. And if you humble yourself, if you bow down before God, if you tell God you are God and I am not, you know how all this goes and I do not. This is not my invention. When you humble yourself, then God will lift you up. That's the way it works. Okay? One more scripture, Proverbs 22, 4. The rewards of humility and the fear of the Lord are wealth and honor and life. The rewards of humility, you have to humble yourself. Okay? And the fear of the Lord are wealth and honor and life. This is why so many people are having a problem in life. Because they don't understand that he is God and we are not. They don't understand that he's the creator and things work the way he designed them to work. So the solution to that anger and frustration you might be having is to humble yourself. Humble yourself before God and say, you are God and I am not. And I didn't invent all this, so I don't know how this goes. So please teach me. Teach me how to do what you want me to do. Teach me how it works. Humility is the key. And if you don't humble yourself, then the Bible says clearly, your sin's not going to be forgiven and your land's not going to be healed. Why do you think some people are just struggling from, from decade to decade to decade of their life? Because they keep trying to do it their way. They won't humble themselves and ask God, how does this work? Do you know how many people never ask God how money works? They just ask God for money. 
They never ask God, how does money work? You ever thought about that? Do you know how many people ask God for a marriage? But they never ask God, how does marriage work? Did you ever think about that? See, you're seeking his hand. Give me stuff. That's why you're struggling. Okay? So, uh, point number one as to why you're angry with God, because he is God and you are not. And everything was created by him, so it works the way he designed it to work, not the way you want it to work. So our first solution is humility. Okay? Let's look at our second point of anger, our second point of why we get angry with God. Second point of why we get angry with God is because you didn't expect to have to fight. Okay? I went over this last time, but you didn't expect a fight in life. You thought life was going to be kind of this smooth sailing, kind of easy going. Everything was just going to line up. All my ducks would automatically be in a row. I wasn't going to have any trouble. I was just going to dance my way through life. Okay? You didn't expect to have to fight. That's why you're mad with God. Okay? What's the solution? The solution is you must learn how to armor up. Because you're going to have to fight. <laughs> All right? Uh, let me show you why you're going to have to fight it, and then we'll get to the armor, okay? First Peter, that's in the New Testament, and remember that Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples or 12 apostles, and Peter was also in the inner circle. Jesus had 12 men that followed him, but inside of that 12, he had three that he was super close to, Peter, James, and John, okay? Peter is one of those three, okay? Uh, same man that wrote this book, First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says... Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, what did the Bible just tell you? Let's look at it phrase by phrase. It said, be of a sober spirit. What does that mean to be of a sober spirit? Okay, it means to kind of have your feet on the ground and not always have your head in the clouds and not be, you know, lit, drunk, tore up all the time. You are inebriated, you know, it means to live a quiet, a, a practical, you know, common sense, wisdom-based life to be sober. You don't want to be somber because then you get sad and dour and negative all the time, but you don't want to be silly because then you don't take life seriously. Both those are the two extremes. You don't want to be somber and you don't want to be silly. You want to be right in the middle, be sober, Okay. It says, be of sober spirit. Then it says, be on the alert. Now, there, right there in the Bible, God is telling you, you have to live life alertly. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, your adversary, your enemy, the one that's against you, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Haven't you ever seen someone who it looked like their whole life just got ate up? Like maybe they got a disease and they wasted down to nothing. Or maybe they made a mistake and it just destroyed everything they built. Or maybe there was an accident or a tragedy. Haven't you ever seen like their whole life get consumed? God says that's the devil running around trying to figure out who he can do that to next. That's the planet you live on. People that are sinners unbelievers that don't believe they need Jesus, that have no relationship with God, are out there against the devil uncovered. They're out there against the enemy with no defense, no armor, because the devil is walking around trying to find human lives to eat up. God just told you that. Okay, so you didn't expect to have to fight. God says that's incorrect. The devil is walking around. Now, I know you have questions as to why is there a devil in the first place and why is he on earth? Those are, I got, we got answers for that, but that's not the focus of this teaching. I'll have to teach on that later. The focus of this teaching is you have to understand that the devil's here and he's the adversary and he's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So if you are not saved, if you are not covered by the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus, and you are not justified before Father God, that means you are out there against the devil uncovered on your own. And that's why the devil just takes people out, man, just throws cancer on their lungs. Just, just you know, gets them caught in a car fire, just, just drown kids in the pool, just, 
just, you know, these, these unexplainable accidents, all this stuff happening, because you're out there uncovered. If you're not a Christian, if you're not under the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus, and you're not justified right before Father God, you're out there against the devil on your own. This is why so many people get mad at God, because you didn't think he was going to have to fight in life. Yes, you do. Yes, you do have to fight in life. It doesn't matter whether you like that or not. It doesn't matter whether you think that's fair or not. You have to fight in life. Okay? So God tells you, you got to sober your spirit up. Can't be silly and can't be somber. Can't be, you know, don't take anything seriously. And then you can't be, take things too seriously. You got to be right in the middle. And he says, be alert. Because the devil's out there. Okay? Uh, let me show you another reason why you have to fight. Then we'll get to the armor. Matthew. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew. Okay? Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Good God Almighty. Okay. Now, let me just say here that a lot of people don't believe in demons. And a lot of Christians don't believe in deliverance. Okay. I don't understand that because the Bible talks about it. The Lord did it. He taught his followers to do it. Paul did it. Peter did it. Jesus did it. So I don't understand these Christians that say they don't want to deal with demonology, they don't want to deal with unclean spirits, they don't want to deal with casting out demons. It was a part and parcel of the Lord's ministry, but you have to understand, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Just because you don't want to deal with it, that doesn't make it go away. You understand that? That's like saying, because you don't want to draw up the arrangement for, for your funeral, that you're not going to die. Just, well, I don't want to deal with it, I don't want to think about my own funeral. Well, that means that when you die, your family is going to be scrambling trying to figure out what you wanted. It doesn't make your death day go away just because you don't want to drop your funeral plans. Well, just because you don't like the fact that there are demons here does not make them go away. And I don't care what kind of so-called Christian denomination you belong to. Okay, uh, you, we need to be going by the Bible. <laughs> okay, and the scripture tells us about unclean spirits and how they behave. That means you've got to deal with it. Haven't you ever met someone and it just seems like there's something really off about them or it seems like they just keep encountering the same problems or it seems like they are supernaturally angry? What I mean by that is they don't just have like a normal regular temper. They have this wild, crazy temper. You know, you might be dealing with an unclean spirit. You might be dealing with a demon that needs to be cast out because there's all kinds of unclean spirits that you need to get broke off you and broke off your life. And I liked what my pastor said. My pastor just said that this Sunday. My pastor said, dealing with deliverance, casting out demons, is not exceptionally deep. It's normal for the Christian. It's just that a lot of Christians want to stay shallow. They don't want to deal with life as God has described it. That's why I told you the first cure is humility. Because you're still trying to operate on your map of life. But God is telling you, there's unclean spirits out here. And, and in Matthew, it talks about how they behave. It said that an unclean spirit walks through dry places seeking rest and find none. If you didn't know why, it's because unclean spirits are fallen angels. They got kicked out of heaven because they listened to Lucifer. So they don't have any place to live anymore. They, they can't come back to heaven. And we have dominion over earth. So that's why they're always trying to jump in people, if you didn't know that. If you ever wonder why demons are always trying to jump in people, because we have dominion over the earth. They have no place to go. They left their first place in heaven and earth was not made for demons. Earth was made for us. Okay? So it says, seek and rest, find none. Then the demon says, I returned unto my house from whence I came out. Okay? That means that if you've ever been delivered from something, that something you got delivered from is going to try to come back. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. Did you know that? And then it says, when, it come, uh, when he has come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. What does that mean? That means that you got that demonic influence out of your life, but you didn't fill back up with the Word and the Holy Ghost. One more time. 
Then he, the unclean spirit, says, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Okay? That means you got delivered. You got them spirits broke off of you, but you didn't get filled back up with anything. Your house is still in. It's clean, and it's in order, but it's empty. Okay? When you get delivered from anything, you need to fill back up with the truth of God's word and with the Holy Ghost. Let me give you some practical examples. A lot of people think that when they stop smoking, that's all they have to do. When you stop smoking, you have just stopped putting the damage on your lungs, but you need to fill your body back up with uh, antioxidants that help push the cancer out of your cells. Because just because you stop smoking doesn't mean all that damage went away. You see what I mean? If you're in a bad relationship, before you get into your next relationship, just because you broke up with that person doesn't mean there aren't any scars. You need to get your soul filled back up with good self-esteem, healthy self-esteem, and love. Okay? That's why so many people, when they cheat, they cheat with their exes. Because you never got filled back up with anything else. So they came back. And the comeback works. Have you ever noticed when you do the second go around, you do it the second time, the relationship is worse? Where do you think that comes from? Okay? Then the Bible says, Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Haven't you ever seen somebody yo-yo with, like, alcohol? Like they say, you know, I'm done, I'm done drinking, I ain't gonna drink no more. I ain't gonna drink no more, I'm done. I'm done drinking. I'm done with that. And then it looked like a few more years passed and it looked like they had worse alcohol. You know why? Because that alcohol demon came back with seven more alcohol demons worse than the first one he had. That's why when you get delivered from anything, you have to fill your house back up with the word of God and the filling of the precious Holy Ghost. Otherwise, that stuff you came out of going to try to come back into your life. And it's going to come back with seven worse spirits. You understand that? This is the way life is for every human. This is why people are mad at God. Because, again, point number two, you didn't think you was going to have to fight. Yes, you do have to fight. you got to fight some of the same stuff that the devil used to destroy your parents. Did you know that? If there's something that runs in your family, the devil's going to try to attack you the same way he tried to attack your grandparents and your parents. Did you know that? If your mother or your father was violent, the devil's going to try to do everything he can to make sure you have a bad temper. If your mother or your father or your grandparents were chain smokers, the devil's going to do everything he can to put cigarettes in your hand by the time you're 10 years old to get you in that habit of smoking. Did you know that? If there's a lot of divorce in your family, the devil's going to do everything he can to try to make sure every generation in your family is a broken generation, that nobody has a stable home. Because you're going to have to fight even some of them spirits that your grandparents and your parents fought. Because the Bible told you that even when you get deliverance, if you don't get filled back up, if your house is clean but it's empty, that that unclean spirit that got broke off of you is going to try to come back. That's why I always tell people whenever I do deliverance, you have to start saying the word of God. Especially when we're doing something like sickness, physical healing, you have to keep saying it. If you get healed, you have to hold on to your healing by confessing the word of God. Because I guarantee you, the devil's going to try to come back and make you sick again. You see what I mean? Okay, so no, number two reason that you're mad at God is because you didn't expect you are going to have to fight. But the Bible tells you, the devil's out there walking around like a lion. The Bible tells you there are unclean spirits out here. And even when you get delivered from stuff, they try to come back seven times worse. What's the solution? Armor up. For that, we need to go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. I know you're very familiar, well, a lot of you that are really, you know, studying the word are very familiar with this, but we're going to look at it. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, after you have done everything to stand. I'm reading from the NIV. 
Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish, extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and there's that word again, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, that's a lot. I can't possibly exegete all of that tonight, but there's a lot in those verses. You can see there's a lot in those verses if we go, you know, if I do like I normally do and go phrase by phrase. But right there, Apostle Paul is telling you, we'll look at the first verses, finally be strong in the Lord in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Stop. Paul said, put it on. That means if you haven't put it on, it's not on. It's not automatic. That's another mistake that Christians make. The Bible says you've got to put it on. You've got to put on God's armor, okay? Don't you dress yourself in the morning before you go to work? Do your clothes come on automatically? Do you pray in tongues and ask the Holy Ghost to put your clothes on? No, you don't. You put your clothes on. So you put your physical clothes on. you got to put your spiritual clothes on. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So how in the world we got the message in the church that we don't have to fight is beyond me. And if we don't have the right understanding, then we can't tell unbelievers, we can't tell people that don't know the Lord how all of this actually goes. Because they don't know that they're out there against all this stuff unarmored because they don't have Jesus. And then you have some Christians that are saved, but they're not spirit-filled. They're saved and they've been delivered, but they didn't get filled back up with the Word and with the Holy Ghost, and they don't understand how it works, okay? So if you're mad at God, it's because you were up against all this stuff, and you didn't even know you was up against all this stuff, because you have to fight in this life, whether you like it or not. So the solution, uh, number two, is to armor up. Armor up, Okay? All right, let's move on to point number three. And remember, you can go back and watch the previous video, No More Genies, number five, to hear me go through each one of these points in more detail. Okay, point number three as to why you're mad at God. You're mad at God because you didn't expect Satan to hit you so hard. <laughs> okay, you didn't expect Satan to hit you so hard. Okay. Let's look at 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Okay? So what's the solution uh, for not expecting Satan to hit you so hard? We're going to use that same verse, 1 Peter 4.12. The solution is to adjust your mindset. Okay? 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, think. Stop. What does it say? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Now let me stop here a minute. And let me deal with what I call the why me complex. Because all of us go through that. All of us go that why me? Oh God, oh God, why me? Oh God, why me? Why does this have to happen to me? Oh God, why? Why God, why? Why did this happen to me? Okay? That's a complex <laughs> built on our human pride because that means that you thought that couldn't happen to you. Why couldn't that happen to you? Why? Whatever defense you think you have is incorrect. If you think that that, whatever that is, can't happen to you because of age, you're too old or you're too young, or because of skin color, or because of your ethnic background, or because of your family name, or because of your finances, or because of your education, or because you have a big, beautiful house, or because your husband is handsome, or because your wife is beautiful, or because you drive a really nice car, or because you're really educated. Those are all things that are the pride of man, because don't none of that stop life from happening to you. None of that stops life from happening to you. I know you don't like it. 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 And the reason you don't like it is because we have built an entire false kingdom 
based on human pride. And you know how we do that? It's because we think based on whatever our personal criteria is, that it's some kind of bulletproof shield. That that don't happen to me because I'm white. That don't happen to me because I got money. That don't happen to me because I'm educated. Whatever it is that you're talking about, none of that is true. You know how I know it's true? Because 1 Peter 4.12 says, you're not supposed to think that it's strange when you get tried by fire. Because everybody gets tried by fire. Every single one of us humans gets tried by fire, but sinners get consumed because they don't have the protection of God, the word of God, the armor of God, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. They don't have none of the tools that we have in the kingdom. We get tried by fire too. Okay? Peter said it's not a strange thing. Okay? But sometimes the devil hits us so hard. Okay? Hits us so hard. And so the solution when the devil hits you hard like that, is to adjust your mindset. Because, because if you were, if I told you around the corner from your house right now is somebody that's ready to rob you, you would either go the other way and avoid them altogether, but if you had to go that way, you didn't have any choice, you would go out there with your hands up. You go out there with a shield. You grab something. You grab a weapon. You grab something. You put your backpack in front of you. If you had to, do you know why? Because you were expecting the blow. Ah, can you see it? You were expecting the blow because I told you somebody right around the corner from your house right now going to try to jump on you and steal your bag, steal your wallet, steal your car keys, whatever. You go out there like this. You wouldn't go out there, don't do don't do like that. You go out there like this. You know why? Because you'd be bracing for the blow. That's what Peter is trying to say. Peter's trying to say it's not a strange thing when you get tried by fire. Because everybody gets tried by fire. The difference between people is that uh, everybody's fiery trial doesn't look the same. But everybody gets some kind of fiery trial. Sinners get consumed by it. They get destroyed. Believers, we come through it or not based on how ready we are. Okay? There's a story that I want you to read. Uh, well, I guess I'll read it to you. I guess I got time. Uh, okay. It's 1 Samuel chapter 30. Starting in verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were, that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, meaning the Lord, answered David, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now, <laughs> that story, what happened to King David, is the same thing that happened to Job. Somebody came in, burned the city to the ground, stole their wives, stole their children, stole their stuff. And when David came back to the city, they saw, can you imagine... Coming back home in Chicago, well, you know, that's where I'm from. Chicago was burned to the ground. Did you ever think about that? What if you were driving downtown to the Magnificent Mile one day and Chicago was just burnt to the ground, just gone? Okay, so David says that the city was burned to the ground and their families were taken away, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. Okay, then the people started crying. And the Bible says they cried until they had no more power to weep because you can cry until you run out of tears. Okay, And the Bible says David was greatly distressed, and the people spake of stoning him, because they were all grieved. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now I want you to see, nobody loved David like God, and nobody loved God like David. And that still happened. He still had to deal with a city that was burnt to the ground, and the loss of wives and children by Amalekites, by foreigners, by invaders. They came, burned the city to the ground, and stole his family. 
stole his family. Do you understand? This is the man that wrote all those psalms. This is the man that danced before the Lord. This is the man that killed Goliath. Okay? This is the man who, who gathered all that money for that offering for the Lord. Okay? And he still had to go through that. Didn't I tell you something? I'm telling you, a fiery trial is a part of life on planet Earth. And then the Bible says, what, it, what was David's response? He inquired of the Lord and said, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him and said, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. So you have to adjust your mindset. you got to understand that when the devil hits you hard like that, uh, don't condemn yourself for being distressed. Of course you're going to be distressed. Don't condemn yourself for crying. Of course you're going to cry. Sometimes when you cry until you run out of tears, you know you start dry heaving. That's when your chest and your body just heaving. You ain't got no more tears left coming out. But you just <gasps> like that. You just dry heaving. Okay? Don't condemn yourself if you feel that way. Of course you're going to feel that way if you're suffering loss. But what did David do? David went to the Lord and said, what should I do? And the Lord said, pursue them because you're going to overtake them and recover all. You're going to get all the stuff back. David did not say, why, God, why did you let that happen to me? Did you notice that? David went before the Lord and said, what should I do? Okay. So solution number three, you got to adjust your mindset. When Satan hits you hard like that, you got to adjust the way you think. Okay. Because a fiery trial is a part of life on planet Earth. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one, number four. Number four reason why you're mad at God is you didn't understand that Satan watches marriage. I'm reading on, you know, on the news every day about people that are just doing crazy things uh, in their relationship. Like uh, that man, uh, Chris Watts, I believe is his name. Look that name up. That man killed his wife and his two daughters. He strangled, he smothered, I believe, he either strangled or smothered his daughters. And uh, he killed his wife and buried her in a shallow grave. And he put his daughter's bodies in like a cement mixer or a cement trough. I don't have all the details right, but he's on trial right now for murder. And he had a woman on the side and a whole bunch of stuff. Killed his wife and, and his mother-in-law, his wife's parents are just out of their mind with grief. They don't understand. They don't understand. Okay, well, let me help you understand. The devil watches marriage. The devil's always trying to get in your marriage. Like I talked about last time, the devil was in the Garden of Eden, remember? The devil watched the first marriage. That's why a whole lot of people are not really guarding their marriages the way they're supposed to. And that's why you're mad at God, because the devil then snaked his way into your marriage, okay? Well, it's because you didn't understand that the devil watches marriage. He watched the first marriage. He watched Adam and Eve. Remember? Then he came up to Eve and started introducing her to some wrong information. Remember? Okay? So what's the solution? The solution is you have to build your marriage according to the word. You cannot build your marriage based on what you think. You can't build your marriage based on what you feel. You got to build it according to the word. We're going to look again at Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So, if you're mad at God about your marriage because you didn't understand that Satan watches marriage, the solution is to build your marriage according to the word. Because the Lord says, amen, Sally B, because the Lord says that if you hear what the Lord has to say and you do it, that makes you wise. And the Lord said, that's like building your house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew 
and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that the difference between people is not what happened to them. Because the same thing happened to both of them. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and they beat upon the house. That wasn't the difference. That's why you're mad at God. You think that your circumstances are supposed to be different. Okay, I'm going to deal with that in a minute. That's a good question, Sal. I'm going to deal with that in a minute. Uh, uh, remind me. I'm going to deal with that in a minute. I'm going to deal with that question in a minute uh, about drinking and submission to your husband. Okay? But the same thing happened to uh, both people in the story. Okay? So the Lord said the difference between people is not the fact that the rain's coming and the floods and the winds and they're going to beat up on your house because that's going to happen regardless. Remember I told you? But the Lord said the difference between people is if you hear what the Lord is saying and you're doing what he says to do, that that's what makes you wise. And then you're building upon a rock. you got to build your marriage on the word of God. you got to build your marriage on what the Lord says do. That's what's going to make it stand, you know, uh, against all these adversaries, against all this trial, is if you build it the way the Lord says, build it. but the Lord says, if you don't listen to Jesus, if you don't do, listen to what the Lord is telling you, then you're going to go through all that and your house is going to fall and great will be the fall of it. And a lot of people are mad at God because their marriage fell apart. Somehow you think that's God's fault that your marriage fell apart. I stopped by to tell you, it's not God's fault if your marriage fell apart. The Lord tells you that right there. The Lord tells you your marriage is going to go through descending rain, floods, blowing winds, and they're going to beat on your house, regardless of who you are. The difference between people is the Lord said that some people listen to me and build their house upon the rock of my word. And Jesus says some people hear what I have to say, but they don't obey. They don't build their house upon the rock of my word and their house is going to fall. And that's why your marriage fell. That's why your marriage fell because you didn't build it according to what the, what the Lord said. Now, let me hasten to say something like marriage is very, very complicated and complex and there's a lot of scriptures that deal with marriage. So Matthew 4.4 4 is where you want to start. The Lord says in Matthew 4, 4, mankind shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You've got to study marriage from Genesis to Revelation. What a lot of people do, I find out, is they pick out a word. <laughs> they pick out a word from God and then try to do that. No, your marriage is more integrated. It's like a Jenga puzzle. Have you ever seen that, that game Jenga? Uh, it's integrated. It's got a lot of little pieces that all fit together. And if you move any one of them, the whole thing can fall apart. Okay. So Sally, let me answer your question. The answer to your question is, is that uh, that you seek counseling with your pastor, maybe a professional counselor, because there's too many details, too much information in that situation. Um, if you're dealing with a substance abuse problem, if you're dealing with a substance abuse problem, there's three people in the relationship, uh, two spouses and the substance. Okay. And so I would suggest, again, that you go to your pastor, go to a professional counselor, and seek some help because it's a very complicated situation and it's not something I could just give a flat answer to, you know, because there's a lot of details, a lot of stuff going on in situations like that. And that's a mistake I've seen a lot of people make in churches just giving people these, these flat answers. No, every situation needs to be dealt with on an individual basis. And when you're dealing with something like substance abuse, that is a very complex situation because there's three people in the marriage, husband, wife, and the substance. So again, I would say to seek pastoral counseling and to seek professional counseling to try to work through stuff like that, okay? Because may, there may, may need to be some deliverance. Like I talked about earlier, uh, maybe an alcohol demon. If it's an alcohol demon, that needs to be broken off. But even when the unclean spirit is broken off, you got to fill the house back up with the Word and the Holy Ghost or else the alcohol demon is going to come back. So there's just too many elements. See, yeah, there's too many elements in there for me to just kind of give a flat answer. So that's my recommendation for that. Okay? So, uh, again, like I told you last time, you didn't understand that the... You're welcome, Sally. God bless you. You don't understand that the devil watches marriage. And if you want your marriage to stand, you can't be out there just doing what you want to do. Because a storm is coming. Okay? 
All right, uh, and we talked about this. Uh, number five, uh, you thought that there might be special rules for you. Satan doesn't care about pregnant women, mothers, or newborn infants. Okay? So here's what you need to understand. The solution is that there is no respecter of persons with God. Okay? That's Romans 2.11, for there's no respecter of persons with God. Acts 10.34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. This feeds more into that why me complex. Do you know why we have that again? It's because we have built our entire man's kingdom based on respecter of persons. We have different rules for white people, different rules for black people, different rules for old people, different rules for young people, different rules for really nice looking people, different rules for less attractive people, different rules for heavy people, different rules for people with money. We have, uh, uh, as humans, we build our entire societies based on respecter of persons. But there is no respecter of persons. The devil's not a respecter of persons. The devil don't care nothing about if you're a woman, if you're a baby. And God is no respecter of persons. But there's also things in life that are no respecter of persons. Let me give you an example. Like bacteria. Like a virus. Do you think that when a cold virus is going around, the virus says, oh, there's a woman, we can't give her a cold, let's just make the men catch cold? What about weeds, when weeds grow on your lawn and your, your backyard, and you got all kinds of dandelions, all kinds of weeds coming up through the ground? Do the weeds say, we can't grow in this neighborhood, we can only grow and grow over on the south side? <laughs> weeds don't do that, weeds grow anywhere, okay? Gravity, okay? If there's a baby in a high-rise, if there's a 30-story high-rise apartment building and there's a baby out on the balcony and that baby comes to the edge of the balcony and falls off, does gravity look up and say, oh, Lord, that's a baby, so let me shut off so the baby can float to the ground so the baby don't get hurt? No, it doesn't. Gravity is no respect of person because what goes up must come down. Doesn't matter. You see what, you see what I'm saying? So that's what I mean when I say the problem you're having uh, is that you're still too, too hung up on respecter of persons because that's the way we treat each other as people. And that because we treat each other that way, we think that God is that way, but he's no respecter of persons. We think that the devil is just going to hit certain people. The devil don't care nothing about hitting pregnant women. The devil don't care nothing about hitting babies. The devil don't care what color you are. Okay? There is no respect of persons. And all that is a bunch of mess we have to get out of our minds and understand that there is no respect of persons with God. If you live on a planet where certain things can happen, that means it can happen to you. You are dealing with the same kinds of things in life as everybody else. And that's why a lot of people don't have a strong prayer life. And that's why a lot of people don't fear God. They're walking around thinking that it's going to be different for me. It's going to be different for me because I'm young. It's going to be different for me because I'm nice looking. It's going to be different for me because I got money. It's going to be different for me because I'm white. It's going to be different for me because I'm black. It's going to be different for me because I'm a man. It's going to be different for me because I'm a woman. Blah, 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 blah. All that is respect to person. All that is wrong. <laughs> we believe it so strongly. We believe it so strongly. We believe it so strongly. And it's all wrong. Bacteria, viruses, cold, flu, whatever, they don't just light on people and avoid others based on who you are. Weeds don't grow in the backyard of some people and not others. Gravity doesn't work for some people and not others. It's just not true. And the devil don't care nothing about who you are. And there's also no respect of persons with God. So if you're mad at God, it's because you're still dipping into that why me complex you didn't know that ain't no special protection just because it's a baby. Ain't no special protection just because it's a pregnant woman. Ain't no special protection just because you're whatever your ethnicity is. That's not the truth. That's why people get mad at God because they thought their demographics granted them special protection. That's not true. Okay? All right. Let's move on to the very last one. Uh, reason number six that you might be mad at God is because you sowed corruption, but you didn't expect to reap it. A whole lot of people are mad at God because they think that God is, quote unquote, putting something on them. Okay, what you may be experiencing is your harvest. 
what you may be experiencing is your crop. Okay? Um, so let's look at Galatians. This is both the scripture I used last time, and we're going to use this scripture for the solution. So you might, for, let me give you some practical examples. There's a whole lot of people that when they're young, they only date married people. You just want to hook up with somebody married. You don't want to get with nobody single. You want to get somebody that's already married. Let me tell you something. If you spend your time dating married people, when you get married, your spouse is going to cheat on you. Count on it. Because as you sow, so you reap. Okay? If you always walking around bad-mouthing, you don't never have nothing good to say about nobody. Every time you show up, you got a critical word. Then as you sow, so you reap. Then people are going to turn around and turn that same criticism back on you. Okay? So you may have sowed corruption, but somehow you didn't think you was going to reap it. Mm -mm. So let's look at Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting, reap everlasting life. Okay? There God told you how it works. That as you sow, so you reap. So the solution is to change your seeds and your sowing. If you want to have a marriage with integrity, you have to become a person of integrity. If you want to have a big harvest, you have to sow big seeds, and you have to work hard. If you want to get to any place in God, you got to spend a lot of time in the Word. you got to spend a lot of time in His presence and prayer. you got to go to the house of God and go to church, and you have to learn and grow in the Spirit. You don't just pop your fingers and get someplace in God like that. You reap what you sow. So if you don't like your harvest, the best part, now, there's a, a motivational speaker named Jim Rohn. He's passed on. But the late, great Jim Rohn said one of the best parts about being a human being is that if you don't like, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if you don't like the last six years of your life, you can tear up that script and write a new script. That's the truth. If you don't like the last six years of your life, you can tear up that script and write a new one. But the solution is that you must change your seeds and your sowing. And a whole lot of people are mad at God because of your harvest. You sowed into that. You're the one that did all that. Let me give you another example. Another example that I try to tell people all the time is when you get married and you try to change people. When you tell your spouse, that, or when you try to change them, you're telling them in no uncertain terms that they're not good enough as is. And if you keep trying to change them, you keep sowing into telling them they're not good enough as is. The day going to come where that very same person that you said wasn't good enough as is is going to turn around and tell you that you're not good enough as is. And then you're going to get mad. You're going to be like, what? You want to understand where that came from. You just sowed 20 years into telling them that they weren't good enough as is. I know. I know you never thought about that. You sowed into that. You sowed into that. You sowed into that. You sowed into that. Same with diet. If you fill your body with a lot of unhealthy food, it produces unhealthy situations in your body. You got to fill your body with good food and exercise and rest if you want your body to last, if you want your body to work for you. Because as you sow, so you reap. And a lot of people are mad at God because they think that God put something on them. That is not God putting something on you. That's your harvest. That's your crop. That's you reaping exactly what you sow. So stop being mad at God because you sowed tomatoes and you got tomatoes. Stop being mad at God because you sowed corn and you got corn. Stop being mad at God because you sowed squash and you got squash. That's the law. That's the way it works. That as you sow, so you reap. That's why so many people that get into a marriage by affairs don't understand like Dr. Phil say, if they'll do it with you, they'll do it to you. You can't be the side dude, the side chick. You can't be out here on the side sleeping with somebody married, and then you get them to break up with the person they with, and then you become a spouse and think they won't cheat on you, because they will. If you come along with the express purpose of trying to take another man's wife, somebody going to come along and take your wife. If you come along with the express purpose 
of trying to take another woman's husband and then you become the wife, you get that other woman out and then he marries you, I guarantee you he going to cheat on you with a new woman. Somebody going to come take him from you. You know why? You did that. Because you sold into that. You can't, you can't be over here being side chicks and side dudes hooking up with married people and think that you're not going to reap that someday because you will. You will, you will, you will. You're going to reap just exactly what you sow. That's one of the first things you learn about being a parent. The first thing you learn about being a parent is when your kids are very, very small, they're going to say and do what they see you say and do, which is why you can't get mad at them if you did all that stuff in front of them. If you did all that stuff in front of your kids, they're emulating the behavior they saw you do. You can't tell your kids not to smoke, and every time they turn around, you got four cigarettes hanging off your lip, and then you're trying to tell your kids not to smoke. You can't. They're just going to laugh at you. Okay? That's what you sold into. Your kids are not going to listen to do what I say, not what I do. They're not going to hear it. They're going to do what they see you do. Okay? You can't be, you can't have it when you wake up, when your kids wake up in the morning and they see all these different people coming out your bedroom. And every time they wake up, let's say you're a single mom and you got a daughter. And every time your daughter wake up, she see a different man coming out your bedroom. When your daughter comes of age, you can't be lecturing your daughter about how she's supposed to be living and you can't be dating all them boys. She's not going to hear you because as you sow, so you reap. Okay. And your kids are going to emulate the behavior they saw you do. Okay? You got a dirty mouth around your kids. Your kids are small. And you're cussing all the time. And you got all kinds of profanity coming out your mouth. Your kids are going to start cussing. They're going to cuss just like you do. Then you're going to get mad. Then you start talking about how well, that ain't right. And little kids shouldn't talk that way. They got that from you. Because as you sow, that's the environment you created in your house. You did that. As you sow, so you reap. So stop being mad at God that you have reaped exactly what you have sown. If all you do is lie, all you're going to get back is lies. People are going to lie to you. If all you do is cheat, you are going to get cheated. Every cheater going to get cheated on. Every player going to get played. Every gamer going to get gamed. Okay? Because as you sow, so you reap. Stop being mad at God because you reaped your harvest. The solution is to change your seeds and your sowing. Okay? All right. We'll do a quick review. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Number one reason we're mad at God is because he is God and we are not. And everything in creation works the way he wants it to work. So the solution is humility. Humble yourself before God. You're mad at God because you didn't expect to have to fight. The solution is to armor up because there are unclean spirits out here you won't have to deal with. So armor up. You're mad at God because you didn't expect Satan to hit you so hard. The solution is to adjust your mindset because fiery trials are a part of the game. You're mad at God because you didn't understand that the devil can get in your marriage. The solution, build your marriage according to the word. Because if you build it the way Jesus says to build it, when a storm comes, it'll stand. And if you don't, it'll fall because the devil's watching. Okay? Uh, number five reason you're mad at God because you thought it was special rules for you. You thought that life was going to skip over you because you're a pregnant woman or a female or a newborn infant or whatever you thought. And the solution is to understand there is no respect to a person. Gravity works the same for everybody. Fire burns, whatever it touches. Okay? Anybody can catch a cold, whatever. Ain't no respect of persons. Ain't no special rules for pretty people. That's just what we think. Okay? And finally, you sowed corruption, but you didn't expect to reap it. The solution, change your seeds and your sowing, because you're going to reap what you sow. So if you want something different, you're going to have to sow different seeds. Okay? All right. So now I gave you some, some scripture, and I gave you some practical examples of how to work through your anger with God. So I hope that was a blessing to you. I hope that really helped you work through uh, any struggles you might be having with the Lord because we need to get back to a healthy faith. And I have discovered in my personal walk with God is that when we're struggling like that, it's because we're just not listening. Amen. God bless. We're just not listening to the Lord. 
We're not actually reading what the scripture says. That's why I read you that story in 1 Samuel about David. Because David loved the Lord and the Lord loved David. It's, David still had to deal with a burnt city and captured family. So did Job. Job feared God. Job had strong morals and ethics. And the devil still came after him. So I'll try to give you some scriptures and some practical examples of how to work through that anger because we have to get back to a healthy faith to where we're reading God's word and listening to the voice of the Lord and taking it for what he's saying and believing God, believing that what God says is true. And we have to crucify what we think and all those wrong ideas, we've got to throw them out and replace them, fill back up with the word of God and the Holy Ghost. Okay? All right, I didn't see any prayer requests, so we're going to move to the next part. Let me see if there's anybody that needs physical healing. Hmm. Okay, the Lord told me somebody's out there, something wrong with your tongue. Maybe you've got a, a wart or a lump or something underneath your tongue. So here's what to do. Put, uh, well, you could put your hand on your tongue, but I can't talk about putting my hand on my tongue. Put your hand on your lips, your mouth, or your tongue, and say, in the name of Jesus, by his stripes I am healed. And I command my tongue to be every whit whole. And you'll feel it break off you. Okay? Somebody out there, you got a pain on your side. You got a pain on your left side. Put your hand on your left side and say, in the name of Jesus, I command my pain to go away. Say that by his stripes I am healed. And you'll feel the healing power of God shoot right through your side. And that side will be every whit whole. Because it's the power of God that makes a difference. All right? Now let me see if there's any unclean spirits that need to be broken off people. Uh. Uh. Okay, the Lord is saying there's some people watching me that's still dealing with a poverty mindset. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that spirit of poverty. Now, here's what to do. Go get your wallet or your purse. I'm going to just use this paper as a substitute because my wallet's all upstairs and I don't want to make you wait. Go get your wallet or your purse and hold it in your hand like this right here. Okay? And say, in the name of Jesus, I cast out the spirit of poverty. For God is a God that hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Again, you got to hold up your wallet or your purse, put your hand on it and say, in the name of Jesus, I break and cast out the spirit of poverty. For my God is a God that hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And you need to say that every day because the devil's going to try to come back on you with a poverty, because poverty is an old demon. Poverty is a very old, fat, heavy demon. The devil's going to try to come back to you, say, in the name of Jesus, God has pleasure in the prosperity of a servant. So I'll break, curse, and cast down the spirit of poverty off of my wallet, off of my basket in my store, off of my life in Jesus' name. Okay? All right. Uh, let me see if there's another word that the Spirit of God has. Hmm. For behold, my people, I want you to work through your anger with me. I want you to draw near to me because I never meant for you to be defeated. Even though the devil's wandering around, even though there are unclean spirits, I never meant for you to be defeated by them. So come unto me, my people, and read my word. Listen to my voice. Armor up. Draw close to me. And I will show you how to get victory in every situation, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Well, that's a blessing to me. I always feel blessed when I hear what the Holy Ghost has to say. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to my second Thursday night, No More Genies. If you want to watch all of them, you can uh, you can uh, look uh, find them on my Facebook page. God bless you. You can find them on my YouTube channel and watch all the No More Genies. Uh, because, again, we're dealing with genie concept. We're getting rid of throwing away those old wrong ideas about God and looking at what the Word actually says. Also, I want you to get on my email list. That's on my Facebook page. So sign up on my email list so that when new content drops, uh, you'll be alerted. There's no spam on any of my lists. I don't because I hate spam, so I don't send spam to people. I just send you an alert so that when something new drops, you'll be ready. And remember to like and share this video, and remember to watch it more than once because I gave out a lot of information, so you're going to have to watch it 
you know, a couple of times and make sure you get every nugget of what I'm saying. And please be sure that get, this gets shared around the world. All right. Thank you. God bless you this Sunday coming up. Yeah, I will be here. My regular time this Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the weekly live prophetic word. All right. That, now, let me tell you this. At the end of every year, I do something called a locator word. A locator word is where we ask the Lord to locate us in the spirit. Where are we at the end of the year? And then what does he want us to know for the beginning of the year? It's called a prophetic locator word, where God lets us know what he has to say about 2018 and gives us our grades and lets us know what was good and bad and right and wrong and up and down for this year and then sets us off on the right path for 2019. That's called a prophetic locator word. I do that every year. So I will be letting you know when that drops. Okay, a prophetic locator word because you need to get your grades from Jesus every year. Do not wait until you die. Why would you wait until you die to find out how you were doing? Because it's, it's too late then. You can't go back and live your life over. So at least once a year, you need to go before the Lord and get a locator word. Say, Lord, where am I? Am I, excuse me, am I in your will? Where am I as a person? Where am I? Where are we as a family? Where is my city? Okay, did you ever think about getting a locator word for your city? Because I know we need one for the city of Chicago, and I got one too. Uh, where is my nation? Where is my country? You need to find, locate yourself in the spirit and ask yourself in relationship to Jesus, Lord, am I, in, am I in your will? Am I doing what you want me to do? Are you pleased with what I have done with 2018? Because if the Lord says no, then you need to course correct. Then you need another locator word. Okay, then Lord, for 2019, show me where I should be and what I should be doing. Because you don't want to waste your days you don't want to waste your life. Don't wait until you die and you stand before the Lord in judgment because then you don't get another chance. Your life is lived in. Get a locator word at least once a year so you know where you are in the spirit. I do that every year, okay? And I post that on my YouTube channel. But this year, I might do it live or I might do a combination. I'm not sure. So just watch this space. Just watch my Facebook and my Periscope and my Twitter and I'll let you know if I'm just going to post it on YouTube, which is what I normally do, or if I do like a live broadcast to get, but, but I definitely am going to do a locator, prophetic locator word for the end of 2018 so we can find ourselves in the spirit and for the beginning of 2019, two separate words, so we can understand where the Lord wants us to be as the new year kicks off. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in live. Thank you for signing up on my email list. Thank you for all your likes and shares, for getting the word of God around the world. Thank you for y'all, all your financial donations. Thank you for your prayer requests, and thank you for your encouraging comments uh, as we go through. God bless you. You know, I love you with the love of Christ. You, you, I say it every week. It's an honor to serve God. It's an honor to be used by God, and I'm, I'm just happy that he sees fit to use me, and I feel blessed to flow in the prophetic, and I want you to flow in your gift too. All right? God bless you, and I'll see you Sunday, 2.30.